Hey y'all and welcome back Beard Battalion members and if you're new I'm Sir Pinkbeard and welcome to the channel. Now if you happen to watch my previous video on why I really quit teaching, you probably walked away thinking man that guy did not enjoy his time as a public school teacher at all. Well, the fact of the matter is, is I really loved teaching, but it wasn't necessarily just the job. It was the interactions with students. It was getting to know who they were and what they enjoyed that really made the job awesome. And so what I figured I would do is I would give a top 10 favorite teaching moments for my time as a public high school video game development teacher. So without further ado, let's get started with number 10. All right, so number 10 is actually catching students cheating. Now, wait a second, Pinkbeard, how did that make it to your top 10 teaching memories? Well, actually, there are two memories specifically that made it into this top 10 because they are so ridiculous that they had to be told. So, cheating memory number one was this student who shall remain nameless. Basically, I was giving this test on Google Forms, and it was a quiz. As long as they had studied, everything should have been okay. They were at the computer, and they go to Google Form, take the quiz, and then I get the results immediately. It's a fantastic tool if you're a new teacher. Create all of your quizzes on Google Forms, and then never grade them again, because Google will do that crap for you. Pro tip. Okay, so this student took his cell phone to the computer, which normally I wouldn't care because I was a tech classroom and I took my phone to the computers, they got to take theirs. But during the quiz, what he would try to do is pull his phone out of his pocket and scroll up the PowerPoint, which I had also posted onto our Google Classroom page to get the answers. Now I noticed he was doing this and so what I did was stand right next to him, like uncomfortably close, but still giving him some personal space so he couldn't look at his phone. And then I would look at the other students or maybe turn around and try to catch him in the act of cheating. And then eventually he just submitted it and was like, why were you standing so close to me? And I just looked at him and I was like, because you were using your phone and I didn't want to fail you, so I wanted to see what you knew on your own. He goes, well, I failed anyways because I didn't read the PowerPoint. And I was like, well, Kinda, that's on you. So I, I don't care, I guess. I just don't care. But congrats on being honest and not cheating. So that's number one. That's something that I think I'll remember forever. But number two is even weirder. So normally, you think that students would try to devise some type of cool or clever way to cheat. Maybe a cough or the tap of the pen or the clicking of the pen. Um, a lot of my students had tried those methods in the past and I generally caught them. But this one student thought he was so slick or maybe invisible. Now he literally decided to stand up in his chair and look over very exaggeratedly at his neighbor's test. When I called him out on it, he goes, I legitimately didn't think you would see me. I gave it a shot and I gave him a zero on the test. So that is my top 10. That's definitely top 10 ridiculousness that students have gotten into cheating. So there we go. Those are the two stories I had to tell. If you're those students, you know who you are and you know you deserve the grade you got. Now, let's move on to number nine. So number nine is the aha moment. Now, if you're a teacher, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you're not a teacher, let me break it down for you like this. If you've ever seen someone struggling to understand a concept, or maybe you yourself have struggled to understand a concept, but then for some reason, the universe aligns, the planets gather in the right configuration, and you click with whatever material you were trying to understand, that moment, is what we call the aha moment. And helping a student reach that aha moment with whatever curriculum or material we were working on makes it worth it. Makes that entire job, the entire thanklessness of teaching and the rewardlessness of being a public school educator worth it because you get to see that moment and experience that through someone else when they go, I get it now. I get it now and I can do this because now I get it. So as the aha moment goes, that is definitely one of the top moments that all teachers, regardless of their story, as long as they're a good teacher, should experience. So 
Let's move on to number eight. Now with number eight, number eight is kind of a unique thing to me because some teachers rule their classroom like iron dictatorships. You have to do it this way. You can't go to the bathroom. You are not a person. You are a student and you will listen to me, dang it. I think those are bad teachers. So what I did was I ran a controlled chaos style classroom. If you come in and you weren't usually there, it would seem chaotic. But we got work done and students generally loved coming to my classroom because they knew it was a place where they could unwind and be themselves. And so what I wanted my classroom to be was this escape. I wanted it to be a nerdy little escape for all of my nerd children to come in and feel like they had a place where they belonged. Because at the end of the day, I'm a goofball and I take that goofball nature into everything that I do. And so I was presenting myself as a real person and I wanted them to also be real and honest people with me. And that had a little bit of a side effect. So if you're a new teacher, I don't necessarily recommend you do that unless you're in a position where you're gonna get the students again and again and again. But if you decide to run this style of classroom or let students truly be who they are and, and provide them an environment where they can let their guard down, just be warned, you're gonna get a bunch of weirdos. Now, I love my weirdos, but my weirdos also understand that they are weirdos and that I love them anyways. And so you have to accept the fact that if you're going to run that type of classroom, which I was willing to do, that you're going to get a bunch of weirdos and you're going to learn a lot about their anime preferences or what they do with their partners that you didn't ever wanna know. But they're gonna tell you anyways, because you're letting them be who they are. And ultimately, what's the point of a teacher if you're not building the relationships with your students? Because you can't really teach them anything until they know that you really care about who they are. So number eight was letting them be who they are in my classroom. It produced amazing results and I would recommend it to you if you're a teacher. So let's move on to number seven. Now number seven, is one of the rules that I instituted in my classroom. And this actually brings back quite a few memories, but the rule was if you swear, if you drop an F-bomb or any of what we would consider curse words in the States, you owed me push-ups. And if I dropped any F-bombs or swore or used any of those curse words, I owed you push-ups. And so I built this kind of understanding that we were not going to swear in this classroom, which is especially important to me because computer scientists and tech workers are generally known to have foul mouths. And the reason we do that is because what we work with is really frustrating. And for some reason, swearing just makes it seem better. It's not, but it seems better. So what I wanted to do was create an environment where students wouldn't be swearing all the time, so they would have some other way to take out their frustration. And I would let them take out their frustration, but if they swore, or if I swore, we gave push-ups. And the more I had the student, because I had them from sophomore year to senior year, the push-up count that they would have to do would increase every year. So that by the time they were seniors, they really shouldn't be cursing in my classroom because they know better. And that, built this kind of cool mutual respect, I think, with my students. Because when I swore, and it happened, I gave more push-ups than they ever had to do for every curse word that I said. And there was a day where I was very upset at a fellow teacher who was just kind of a dragon. And I let loose. I shouldn't have. I know it was a lack of professionalism on my part, but I let loose in my classroom. And my students heard me and they were like, once the thing was finished, Pinkbeard, you know what you have to do. And we kept track. And that day I did like 100 to 75 to 100 push-ups. I can't really remember, but I did a lot. And I'm a fat guy who doesn't usually do push-ups. So I was like sweating and there was, a, there was almost a puddle of sweat on my classroom floor, which we wiped up and cleaned up, but it was kind of like gross. But that moment defined that, hey, these rules that I have in my classroom, those are not rules for you. Those are rules for all of us. And I'm gonna hold myself to that same standard. So if you're a teacher and you're not 
having those same type of rules, you need to evaluate that because if you want respect from students, you have to give them respect. And you need to hold yourself to the same, if not a higher standard than you hold your students. And that should kind of be evident in everything you do. But that is number seven. Those push-up memories are memories that I'm going to hold on to for quite some time. Let's move on to number six. Now, number six was the fact that I actually had a quote book and students were compiling it from all of my different classes and building this kind of quote book of Pinkbeard. And that was not uncommon for the school I was at because we had some eccentric teachers. And if you're an eccentric teacher and your students love you, they're going to write down the quotes and the things that you say. And they're gonna repeat those stories and they're gonna become kind of these school well-known secrets. But my quote book was a little different in that all of my quotes, and I mean all of my quotes, were taken ridiculously out of context. Because they're funnier that way, why not? I mean, honestly, they are funnier out of context, but every single one of them was taken out of context, and most of them probably could have gotten me in trouble if I didn't explain the story that was going on around it. So, if you guys want a video of me going through the top 10 compiled quotes of my time as a teacher, let me know down in the comments below. I will pick out the best, and we will get a video on that for you guys to find out. But one of the quotes, one of the quotes that got used quite a bit just to give you a taste, so if you want to find out if there are more, was necrophilia is okay. There's more to that story, but I'm not going to tell you the context unless you want a video on it. So that's the quote. We're moving on to number five. Now number five is a bit more serious than the rest of these because it involved my students unironically, unfacetiously, calling me dad, which I'm going to be honest, when I started teaching, I was like 21 years old. I was working with students who were 15. It felt weird to be called dad. And then the whole daddy thing came out. And then I just like, don't, don't call me daddy ever. Please don't. It's weird. You should never call a teacher daddy unless you're married to them. And even then it's strange, but they called me dad. And they called me dad because, I think, because I provided an environment where they could grow and they could voice their frustrations and where I held the same standard of rules for their education that I held for my professionalism. I let them be themselves and I told them that I loved them and I showed them that I loved them and that I was willing to care about them and their problems. And not all of the students that I taught had that at home, which is really sad, but because I was that stability in their life, they called me dad. And it was weird at first, but I actually grew to love it because it meant that I was having a real effect on their lives. But they called me dad, and I called them sons and daughters. And if they've graduated and they're in college now, some of them still reach out to me and call me up and say, hey, things are going wrong. I need some advice. What would you say? And I feel like a proper father when that happens. And I know I'm not their parent, but it means so much to me that I was able to provide and mean so much to them. So let's move on now to number four. Now, my students were weird. We've already talked about that but they were also really creative and really loving. And so what they would do on my birthday for a few years, I think they did it three years maybe, is they would sneak into my classroom after school the day before my birthday, and then they would coat my room in whatever. So one year it was sticky notes and literally everything was covered in sticky notes with a happy birthday message. And like, I found sticky notes for two years because they had hid so many sticky notes in my classroom. And then the next year, they actually coated my room in tin foil. And here's a video of what my classroom looked like. Now this video was taken when I didn't realize I was gonna be using it. So we'd already kind of cleaned up the room, but as you can see, Everything is basically coated in tinfoil. And they would, they would stay for two or three hours after school doing this in preparation to give me a surprise birthday gift. Even though it was really a prank for them, it was something that I really enjoyed and I looked forward to because there was always some actual gift hidden 
in the sticky notes or hidden with the tin foil. And I look back on those memories quite fondly and think of them quite often. So that's number four. Let's go ahead and move on to number three. Now, if you were to pop into my classroom, you would have seen a, a lot of chaos. But one thing that you would have seen all the time is that there was an extra chair by my desk. And no one really asked me why that chair was there. I think they just kind of thought, oh, he just has a chair for maybe rolling around his classroom going to all of the computers. And I used it for that sometimes, but the chair was actually there to give students a place to sit and vent their frustrations about other teachers, about their schoolwork, about their home lives, or about relationships or whatever. And sometimes they would ask advice or sometimes they just wanted to vent. But because I had built this relationship with my students of letting them be who they were and holding myself to a higher standard or the same standard as them. And because they felt like they could trust me because I had become that parental figure in their life, the chair was there so that when they needed somebody else's perspective on an issue that wasn't life-threatening, but they wouldn't go to their parents about because as all teenagers know, their parents know nothing, which changes once they're in their 20s, but teenagers don't believe their parents know anything. So they trusted me that I knew things. So they would sit at the desk in the chair and ask questions and ask for advice. And we would talk and being able to build those kind of relationships with students and to help them through a lot of the junk that they're going through that we don't even realize most of the time. And, and even just giving them the avenue to say, hey, if, it, if you want to take it, you don't have to. I'll never force you to. But if you want to talk, it's there. A lot of good things came from that. A lot of good things for my students. I got to know them better. They got to improve in their own lives. And I got to learn a lot about their perspective. So overall, having that chair next to my desk for students to come and talk was worth it. And it makes it to the top three things that I loved about teaching was being able to have those type of relationships with students who needed my help. Now, just a word of warning, if you're a newer teacher or you don't have the same group of students every year like I did, that might not be a feasible option for you. So don't try to force it. But also, if a student comes to you with a problem, they trust you and they know that you care about them enough. So make sure you make time for them because if you don't, they might not come back the next time and then they might be left all alone. And as a teacher and as someone who deeply cares about high school students, that's the worst thing that can happen. Now let's flip the script and go to a much lighter note for number two. Now in my time as a teacher, I taught some amazing students. And while I don't have time to give a shout out to all of them, there is one student in particular, just one, that I will mark as my favorite student of all time. Now, to clarify, he was not my best student, not in the least. And he knew it and I knew it, but he was and forever will be my favorite student. And maybe, just maybe, that's because of what he could do. This student could make me laugh no matter how angry I was or how upset at the effort that his class overall would put in or just frustrated at the school in general, this student could cheer me up. And he only had to do one thing to do that. Now, when I was figuring out whether or not I was going to quit teaching, I would think about this student doing what you just saw again and again and again. And it would cheer me up to no end. And you know what? Out of all the things I've done, all of all this, the students that I've helped, that one student doing that simple thing that made me laugh and brought me so much freaking happiness, that one student helped me carry on through teaching when I knew I wanted to quit. And I don't think he knows that until he watches this video. And certainly nobody else knows it because I don't really talk about it that much. But, but that student was my favorite student of all time simply because he could always make me remember that teaching was worth it. In the depths of my should I quit or not, 
just his memory was enough to make me go, yeah, I can, I can keep going. And then I could focus on the students that I worked with. And I'm not going to call them out here because I'm going to forget someone and they're going to be upset that they weren't mentioned. So class of 2019 and class of 2018, know that I love you guys immensely. Y'all were my favorites overall. Y'all can't hold a candle to that one student right there. Maybe, maybe that doesn't deserve to be my number two, but but dang it, that's my that's my number two. That student, that student made everything better always. So let's go on to the the best thing, the absolute best thing that I remember about teaching. Now, as a teacher, we very rarely get to know how we affect the students because they don't generally care or think about telling us. And that's fine because they're high school students. We don't expect for them to, oh my gosh, you're so awesome. We don't expect that kind of praise from a high school student. But we often get it when they go to college and they come back and they say, hey, thank you. I didn't realize it then, but, but you had so much influence on my life. And so a lot of high school teachers get that kind of thanks after students have gone and graduated high school, sometimes graduated college, and they can kind of point back to a single class that they loved the most. But when I was leaving the school and my students had found out about it, they compiled some notes. And I have kept this journal and I reread these notes to me pretty frequently, actually, because I'm reminded why I do what I do, why I want to help people grow through the notes that they've left and and that my work that I did while often it felt in vain was not in vain and so I'm just going to read one of these notes to kind of summarize this whole thing but this is number one finding out what students really thought about my class about my teaching about the relationship that I had built with them Sir Pinkbeard I can honestly say that you have been the best teacher I've ever had not because you and I have had the best bond or because you made everything easy. It's because you taught me how to take care of myself. You didn't catch me a break when I was being lazy and you didn't give me a grade that I didn't deserve. You always made me work my hardest to get the grades that I desired. Thank you for showing me what it takes to be a man in the real world. You will be missed. Now, I'm not going to read who that student was from, but there are so many more notes just like that in here, and I cherish each and every one of them. All right, guys, that's a wrap. That's my top 10 teaching memories. But if you want to see why I really quit teaching, you can go ahead and click on the card here and it will take you to that video. And if you'd like to subscribe or put a like or a comment down below, let me know what you thought about this content. That would be fantastic. So as always, thanks for watching. I'm Sir Pinkbeard and I will see you in the next video.